So in this video, we're going to integrate a trigonometric function using a trig identity. So here we have the integral of the square root of 1 plus the tangent squared of x dx. And what we want to recognize is that we have a trigonometric identity underneath the radical sign. So from trigonometry, we know that one of the Pythagorean identities was 1 plus the tangent squared of x equaling the secant squared of x. So we can actually, underneath the radical sign, replace 1 plus the tangent squared with the secant squared of x. And this will still be dx. And then what we have to remember, the, where, where this can get us in trouble is if we mistakenly think that the square root of x squared is equal to x. In fact, the square root of x squared in general is not equal to x. The, the square root of x squared is actually equal to the absolute value of x. And you can see this if you substitute a, a negative number in, for example, uh, in for x. If we have negative 2 squared, the square root doesn't cancel the squaring and give us a negative 2. So the square root of negative 2 squared isn't negative 2. In fact, when you square the negative 2, it becomes positive, and then you get the square root of positive 4 is just 2. So this is one where we have to be careful when we simplify to put the absolute value sign on the secant. So we're going to get the square root canceling the squaring, but we wind up getting the absolute value of the secant function, not just the secant function. And so what this is going to force us to do is to deal with two separate cases. So over here is the graph of the secant function, and what I want to remember from trigonometry is that the secant function is just the reciprocal of the cosine function. So anywhere where the cosine function is zero, the secant function winds up with vertical asymptotes. When the cosine function is positive, the secant function will be positive, and when the cosine function is negative, the secant function will also be negative. So what you want to notice here is that if we have the um, open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, that on that open interval, uh, the, the cosine function actually is positive. So between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, the cosine function looks like this. So the secant function is also positive because the cosine function is positive. So we want to uh, first look at the case where x is an element of the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 because on that open interval the cosine function is positive, which means the secant function is positive. But notice that uh, this is going to repeat itself infinitely many times in both directions. So every two pi radians, we get another interval uh, over which the cosine function is positive. So I'm going to say, hey, let x run on the open interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 plus 2 pi k, where k can be any integer. And uh, using this convention, what I'm saying is uh, add, allow yourself to add integer multiples of 2 pi to the left and right bounds on this uh, integral. And as long as you do that, you'll have a place where the secant function on this interval, the secant function will be positive, will be greater than zero. And if the secant function is positive, we don't need the absolute value sign. So I can just integrate. I can say, hey, as long as the secant of x is greater than zero, which happens here, then I can take the absolute value sign off and from our previous work that we've done, we know how to integrate now the secant function. We know that it's going to be the natural log of the absolute value of the secant of x plus the tangent of x plus a constant of integration. So this is case number one. Case two will happen when the secant of x is less than zero. And this will happen when the sine fu cosine function sorry, is less than zero. And that's going to happen from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So the secant function will be less than zero or negative when x is an element of the interval from pi over 2. So picking up at the right bound of this uh, open interval 
and then running all the way to 3 pi over 2. And then it's going to repeat itself every 2 pi radians in either direction. So I'm going to go plus 2 pi k uh, to adjust for the fact that there are infinitely many intervals over which the secant function will be negative. And then we have to deal with this integral a little bit differently. What we have to say is, hey, when the secant function is negative, the absolute value would make it positive. But one way to do that, another way to do that is to just negate the secant function. So I put the negative sign out here so that when the secant is negative, I get uh, the opposite of a negative is positive, which effectively does the same thing that the absolute value symbol was doing. And now I can go ahead and integrate. So I'm going to get negative coming down. And we know from our previous videos that the antiderivative of the secant function is just going to be the natural log of the absolute value of the secant of x plus the tangent of x. And then it will be plus that constant of integration. So that's the key is to recognize uh, that the secant, uh, that the square root of the secant squared isn't just going to be the secant function. It's sometimes the case if you have the square root of something being squared that you don't need to worry about the absolute value. So for example, if I were doing a definite integral from zero to one and I had the square root of x squared, I could simplify this directly to 0 to 1 x dx because over the interval from 0 to 1 there are no negative values so I wouldn't need uh, the absolute value sign to uh, in order to simplify that.